So the topic today we are going to do is cranial nerves. Okay. And this is a big topic. And before we start, everyone, please turn on your cameras. I need to see if you guys understand what I'm teaching or not. So let's get into this. Now, as you know, our topic involves the brainstem. So when we talk about the cranial nerves, except for two, except for two cranial nerves, everything else originates from the brainstem. Can someone tell me the two that does not originate from the brainstem? Come on guys, unmute and talk. What are the two cranial nerves that does not originate from the brainstem? Okay, it's a very simple answer. Cranial nerve one and two, okay? Cranial nerve one and two does not originate from the brainstem. So when we talk about the brainstem, you will hear words, these three words. So I'm going to divide the brainstem into three parts. This region is called the tectum. The most posterior region, that is the part which is most posteriorly, is called the tectum. And the middle part is called the tegmentum. And the frontmost part is called the base. And usually, let me just give you guys an introduction. The spinal cord tracts, such as the tracts, uh, the cuneate tracts, the gracilite tract, all of those travel in this area, in the base. They travel to the brain in this area. Tegmentum, these are new words. I would assume uh, most of you haven't learned these words. If you have learned it, perfect. If not, let's talk about the tegmentum. This is where you get all the nuclei. The nuclei are usually present here. Okay, And tectum, uh, it has the ventricles, the most posterior part. Okay, so that's the first diagram I need you guys to understand. Next, we'll draw the brainstem. So can someone tell me what this is? Guys, unmute and talk. What did I just draw here? Oh, the brainstem. No, oh, no. Uh, I mean guard junction. Yes. Uh, but what is this opening through which the spinal cord forms the brainstem? It goes inside this opening and forms the brainstem. It's called the foramen magnum. Can someone tell me what this part is of the brainstem? Come on guys, what is this part? So there's three parts in the brainstem. What are the three parts? Midbrain, fawns and medulla. Okay, uh, which is the midbrain? One, two or three? One. Okay, midbrain. Second is points, third is medulla. Yes. Now, there are structures like this. There are some structures coming out like this. And I have told you guys an easy way to remember this. What are these structures? What is this? What is this? What are the other two letters I should write here? guys. Okay, this was spinal cord lecture. I don't know if you guys came. So O is for olive. P is for pyramid. And as you know, our brain is very symmetrical. So what is present on one side will be present on the other side. Okay, our brain is very symmetrical. Anything that is present on one side, so brains, uh, spinal cord, brainstem, all of those, Everything, if there's a nerve coming from here, from the same location, another nerve will come. Don't draw that. I'm just trying to tell you how symmetrical it is. And I assume you guys have heard of a phone company called Oppo. So it's easy for you guys to remember that, okay? It's called the olives and the pyramid. Next. 
can someone tell me what this structure is on the midbrain? What is this structure over here? It's like a, it's a foot process. So it's called peduncle. What peduncle is this? Come on, guys. This is the cerebral peduncle. So the cerebral peduncle is what connects our brain. Our brain, the diencephalon, connects over there. Okay. If you remember, I always drew this part first. Okay, sorry. Uh, I used to draw it like this. Don't draw this. This was the fourth ventricle. Okay, if you guys want, you can draw it. Fourth ventricle. Okay, do you guys remember these? Can you can someone tell me the location of the cerebral aqueduct? This is the cerebral aqueduct. And this is the third ventricle. And again, just for review, here's the thalamus. Okay, it faces anteriorly, the Y structure, which is the gray matter region, it faces anteriorly. And we have the lateral geniculate body and the medial geniculate body, which gives rise to the optic crack, which forms the optic chiasma. Guys, these are stuff we have done in previous lectures and I'm worried that you guys have forgotten most of it. And here's our eyeball. This is the optic chiasma. Optic tract. Okay, let me ask a very simple question. What is present here? Uh, let me, what is present here? Hypothalamus. Yes. So between the two optic optic crack, you have the hypothalamus. And what is this? What is this? The first arrow I drew. Medial and lateral geniculate bodies. Yes. Medial. Medial is involved in the hearing. Lateral in vision. So this is the basic structure that we did. There's a few more things. There are feed processors which goes to the cerebellum. What are those feed processors called? What are these feed Pretty processors? Hmm? Sorry? Pretty cells. Superior mm -hmm. and inferior pedicels. Yes, the peduncles. Peduncles. Super yeah. yeah, superior, middle, and inferior peduncles. Okay, they connect the brain stem with the cerebellum. Okay, next. So now we know what white matter are, right? Can someone tell me what is white matter? Just simply tell what is a, what is white matter in our brain when we look at a CT scan. What do you see as white matter? The fatty substance, myelin. Yes, the myelinated nerve fibers. The nerve fibers which are covered by this myelin sheath. Okay, that is what gives the white color. And that is what we see as that is what we see as white matter. And then we have our cell bodies. So if there is an area which has accumulated cell bodies, what do you call that? Gray matter. Yeah. And 
this is also called the nucleus when there's an accumulation of cell bodies of neurons it will form a nucleus okay can someone tell me the color of the new nucleus Pardon? yeah okay it's very simple stuff whenever you see when you ever you hear the word white matter it just means the axons the parts originating from the cell bodies of the neurons which are myelinated that's why it looks white if not the cell bodies alone will look gray okay and this is very important because there is one important structure it is called the reticular formation can someone tell me the function of the reticular formation this is just a revision right now guys uh, from previous lectures can someone tell me the function of the reticular formation it keeps us awake sorry yes mo uh, it keeps you awake or it keeps it's involved in cerebral arousal okay now let's take a look because this structure is present in the brain stem so i'm going to draw the midbrain then the pons this is anatomy knowledge actually like i don't know we are supposed to know these for anatomy uh guys i need to have more space here because it joins to the thalamus which i'll draw like this and then here's our brain like this okay now let's take a look at this this bundles of fibers and this fact is important these bundles of fibers are made by a mixture of gray and white matter so if you take a section from here if you were to take a section and if you look at that region you will see gray matter and also white matter okay there will be gray matter and white matter i just explain one gray matter and white matter are ah, so it's a, basically a mixture of the two that's what it will look like on histology if you take it under microscope it will look like that okay the importance of this is it keeps your brain awake so throughout the day it keeps your brain active so most of our sensations they come to these to the thalamus and it goes the thalamus is basically the distributor whenever something comes up to the brain it usually has to go to the thalamus first any signal that comes comes to the thalamus first and that directs it to the correct place and actually these nuclei are present on this y okay and these are called intra lamina Okay. okay okay they send signals to keep our brain active okay so as you know throughout the day you get tired so what does getting tired mean in terms of the nervous system does anyone know okay so basically it means our neurotransmitters you know there Decrease are decreasing the neurotransmitters yes exactly the neurotransmitters will decrease that will cause a reduced activity like the brain becomes lethargic it doesn't have the energy to do its proper function you don't have that concentration so gradually and remember our circadian cycle our morning night cycle helps a lot in this so that's why you feel sleepy at night so our body is programmed so that by the time night comes all those neurotransmitters are depleted 
you have no more energy you need to sleep to replenish it okay so let's say you go to sleep let's say it's 8 pm and you go to sleep you were very tired it's a very busy day and you go to sleep okay and understand that now the neurotransmitters i'm just giving values okay it will never be zero it will never ever be zero it will be zero neurotransmitters present in this whole system that will actually lead to death but i just for the sake of understanding okay okay let's just put it as zero uh, okay five and uh, to be awake fully awake you need at least 100 neurotransmitter mo molecules that will be in the morning at 8 a.m so what happens during sleep is our body produces new neurotransmitters okay and in a state like this even if you shout even if someone your roommate or someone shouts it is unlikely that you will awake it is very difficult to wake a person up okay it is very difficult to wake a person up when there's very less neurotransmitters okay and also remember i told you there are pain and pain fibers that go here pain and sorry yeah pain fibers so even if you pinch that person is unlikely to wake up okay now can someone tell me what happens if this goes to let's say one what is that condition called what can it lead to um a coma yes okay it can lead to a coma and what happens if this goes up in the morning to let's say 250 neurotransmitters guys it's very simple to understand this what can happen if it goes to a very high amount hyperactivity yeah and what is that manifesting as seizures seizures okay is one cause of seizures that's actually one reason why most of the seizures occur either when you are tired because there's a sudden production of neurotransmitters or in the morning okay now this is a structure present in the brain stem that's why i discussed that let's take a look at the other stuff that we will need so let's take a look at how our new uh, sorry the cranial nerves originate guys i'm going to draw the brain stem again so can someone tell me what is this structure which is present at the back of the midbrain cord there's two of them actually four two on either side what are those structures called come on guys um cerebellum uh, no uh, it's in the back of the midbrain so the cerebellum back will be somewhere here have you guys oh, heard of yeah um yeah i can't remember the name yes yeah. it's the two colliculi okay colliculi uh, inferior and superior colliculi yes yeah. this is the superior colliculus and this is the inferior colliculus okay and this superior colliculus is involved with what reflexes can someone tell me what is the superior colliculus involved with visual reflexes what is the inferior colliculus involved with then if one is visual what is the other one auditory yes it was a bad idea to write the stuff here it's fine next we look at the pons here's the pons and finally we have the medulla
guys i will give the names as we go okay we'll come back to this diagram and add stuff for now i need you guys to know where the nerves come from so cranial nerve 1 and 2 are not from the brain stem you guys understand that right cranial nerve 3 comes at the level of the superior colliculus okay uh, if i give it here is it correct if i give the nucleus here of the ocular motor nerve is it correct think and tell me and give me a reason so i'm going to divide the brain stem into three parts which part should the nucleus go to the tegmentum part yes it's in the middle okay it's in the middle yeah so it will be here this is the cranial nerve 3 it oh yeah for people who have just done their a levels in sri lanka they will know this name quadrigemina have you guys heard of this the corpora quadrigemina so uh I don't know uh, in our country's education system that name is very commonly used. Then we have the cranial nerve four, and the important thing here is it comes at the level of the inferior colliculus, but it comes from behind. So uh, it doesn't come from the front. It comes from behind and comes this way. Okay. understand that it originates somewhere in the posterior region okay even then the nucleus will be somewhere in the tegmental area okay but it comes the nerve fiber goes from behind and comes forward and the next one is our pons can someone give me the name of this junction uh, at the bottom what is this junction called uh oh, pontum middle yes that is a pontum medullary junction okay pons and the medulla and the junction between those two is the pontum medullary remember in nervous system anatomy almost every word is going to have some sort of meaning behind it that makes it easier for you to remember so first of all these kinds of words whenever you see something like this you can easily understand what it is talking about okay now cranial nerve 5 comes from the middle of the pons okay cranial nerve 5 originates from the middle of the pons and it goes and forms something called the blank um, uh, someone has to tell me the name ganglion can someone tell me what this cranial nerve 5 is what is the name i didn't give the names of these sorry what is the name of cranial nerve 5 trigeminal yes trigeminal okay and this is called the trigeminal ganglion so basically what happens in the ganglion is they are going the nerves are going to reorganize and go in different pathways okay so one branch okay let me just show you the branches here and i will come back i'll draw this again this is our four forehead region can someone tell me the name of the branch that goes to the forehead region ophthalmic yes this is the ophthalmic branch okay o p t h a l m i c branch okay it is also called the b1 branch can someone tell me the branch that goes to this region of our face maxillary yes maxillary branch 
that is V2, and this antebellum. Yes. Okay. Now I have a question. Does the cranial nerve five have a motor function or a sensory function? Like, are you talking because of the ophthalmic nerves function? Not talking. Are you moving your muscles in the face because of the ophthalmic nerve function, or are you feeling this sensation because of it? Motor function. Any other answers? There's only other one more option, but I didn't tell which is correct. Yes. So there is only one motor function. Okay. Now understand this. Whenever you touch your face, all this sensation. So I'm touching this area. This is our ophthalmic region. So the ophthalmic nerve is going to send the signals to this ganglion, to the nerves here. If you touch here, the mandibular regions will send the signals. And if you touch here, the maxillary regions. Now, one important thing, cranial nerve five has a motor branch also that goes with the mandibular branch. And that is what innervates our two muscles, the temporalis and the masseter. That helps you in chewing. I mean, yeah. That movement is done by the mandibular branch. Okay. I hope you guys understand. There's only one motor innovation. Everything else is sensory. Can someone tell me the motor innovations of our facial muscle? Which nerve? There's only one other obvious nerve. Oh, sorry. Facial nerve. Yes. Okay. It's a facial nerve. Now, from the middle of the pons, only the cranial nerve five goes. Let's take a look at the others. If you are to look at this region, the pontomedullary junction from the front, I need you to guys, I need you guys to understand. Like I said, it's a symmetrical structure. So what's present on one side is going to be present on the other side. Okay. So this is the pontomedullary junction. Cranial nerve six comes from here. Cranial nerve seven comes from here. And cranial nerve eight comes from here. Six, seven, eight. Okay. Six, seven, eight. That's how it's going to look. So let's draw that here. So from the most medial aspect, that is from the more central area, you get cranial nerve six. What is the name of cranial nerve six? Abducens nerve. Yes. Now, abducens nerve, that's the name. Can someone tell me what its function is? From the name? Uh, abduction, of the eye. abduction of the eye okay abducens nerve it involves in abduction of the eye so cranial nerve 3 is called the ocular motor nerve oculo motor nerve okay oculo eye movement motor function now cranial nerve 4 can someone tell me the name of this this actually has no relevance in helping you to understand. Trochlear. Yes. Cranial nerve 5 is trigeminal. Cranial nerve 6 is abducens. Cranial nerve 7 is facial. Cranial nerve 8. Can someone tell me 8? This is the one which even I get confused at times. But recently I figured out a way to remember. Vestibular cochlea. Yes. Vestibulo cochlea. No. Okay. The way I remember this is it goes to the ear, right? It goes to our ears. So if you draw a face, what I do is I remember it like this. I draw a, a number eight this way. Okay. And my logic behind that is if you erase these lines, you're going to get a year. 
a hypertrophy DNA like this. Okay, that's how I remember that cranial nerve 8 is vestibulo cochlear nerve. Now, let's look at the medulla. So, since I use this diagram here, I can't use that same diagram. I don't have the space for that. Uh, just draw the medulla part. This is our medulla. Okay. It's very easy to remember this olive pyramid, pyramid olive, and it's called OPO. Okay. Now, give me a second. Uh, okay. So this region, let me, I need to confirm if the word is junction or is it, it's called pre-olivary something. I need to confirm that. Ah, yes. It's okay. This region after the olive is called the post olivary sulcus. So if you guys are new to medicine, anything that says the word post, there are some juniors. That's why I said that. Uh, there are, whatever is post means after, after something. Okay. So post olivary sulcus. And this is the pre olivary sulcus. Okay. Post olivary sulcus and pre olivary sulcus. Why is this important? Because from the pre olivary sulcus, one nerve, the last nerve, the last cranial nerve originates. What's the last cranial nerve? What is the name of the last cranial nerve? Uh, yes. Guys, uh, you will need space to draw the other nerves, but I'll write it here, hypoglossal. Okay, so once I do this here, it'll be really fast when I go to the cranial nerves. The rest, so we have nerves till eight. Nerves nine, what is the name of nine? Glossopharyngeal. Yes, glosso. Pharyngeal nerve. Cranial nerve 10, my favorite. What is that? No. Yes. Or the wanderer. And cranial nerve 11, what is that? Accessory nerves. No. And let me just tell this here accessory nerve has two nuclei. One, which is from the, which it's called the cranial. Cranial nucleus. The other is from the spinal cord. It's called the spinal cord, spinal nucleus. Okay. Cranial nucleus and the spinal nucleus. We'll come into all of that because our topic today is about the cranial nerves. Okay. Oh, yeah. I didn't tell the name. Did I tell the names of these? Yes. Hypoglossal nerve. It originates from the pre olivary sulcus. Okay. So let's go into the cranial nerve discussion. Okay. So remember in stroke, I told you guys there are some, I didn't go into much detail there, but I talked about four cranial nerves are motor, four cranial nerves are sensory, and uh, the, okay, there's a sound. So, okay, today let me explain. Do you remember I talked about the 
embryology of the spinal cord how the spinal cord originates can someone tell me what i call the structure that gives rise to the posterior segment what gives and rise to the, yeah yes it's called the ala plate okay in our embryological fetus stages this region is formed from the ala plate okay and this region is from what by what plate can someone tell me basal plate okay now look at this can you guys see that the ala plate is more to the lateral aspect that is to the sides compared to the basal plate so that's why as you go up to the brain stem the motor nuclei are present medially okay the medial nuclei are motor nuclei so if you cut the brain stem like this and without knowing anything you can at least assume that the lateral nuclei so in this is the tegmental region if this is the tegmentum you can at least assume that the lateral nuclei are sensory and the medial nuclei are motor okay you guys understand this and there is something in that this is a embryological structure it is called the sulcus limitans you don't need that unless you are planning to do usmle okay sulcus limitans separates the lateral and the medial nuclei now cranial nerve 1 we'll go into the cranial nerves don't worry it's going to be fast okay can someone tell me the function of cranial nerve 1 guys what is the function of cranial nerve 1 smiling or yes. effect yes okay okay the cranial nerve 1 has a bulbar structure like this it is called the olfactory bulb and the thing is what i need you to understand is this is not the cranial nerve 1 the cranial nerve one are what i'm going to draw in purple okay those are tiny fibers those are tiny fibers that originate from the olfactory bulb and they come out through the cribriform plates I hope you guys remember there are the cribriform plates. They enter into the nasal cavity through those. Okay, these are the cribri. Okay, remember the cristogalli and the cribriform plates from anatomy. Don't worry, we'll come to that uh, later on. So it comes out there. That is the nerves, and they will join. this bulb is formed because of all these nerves coming and forming a bulb and this is called can someone tell me the name of this part it's called olfactory tract okay and it will go okay one more question which lobe does it go to which lobe of our brain does this go to there's the frontal lobe there's the temporal lobe there's the posterior lobe can someone tell me which lobe it goes to just guess come on guys it's a guess i'm not asking you to give me the exact answer there's three lobes which is relevant which lobe does it go to it goes to the temporal lobe okay 
It's called the peri piriform cortex in the temporal lobe. You can also call it the olfactory cortex. Make it easier for you guys. Okay. And now let's talk about how to diagnose a problem in the cranial nerve one. Let's say you are given a patient and you are, the doctor tells you, let's say you're going for the final exam and the doctor tells you do the new uh, cranial nerve examination on this patient. You have to start with the first cranial nerve. Okay. Unless the doctor tells you do these examinations, you have to do all. But do you, can someone just tell me what you do to test this nerve? Can someone tell me what you do to test if this nerve is working? The patient, make the patient smell. Yeah, that's basically it. You give him an orange. You, do, you blindfold him so that he doesn't know. Okay, you give him an orange. The smell of the orange, you just let him smell that. And you give him something else. Let's say a lemon. And you ask him to differentiate. Uh, you ask him, is there a difference? Or do you get a smell? Okay. Because remember, if you don't get a smell, it also causes impaired taste. Okay. An impaired taste is a very common symptom of this year's champion disease, COVID-19. Most of the patients, they complain of impaired smell and impaired taste. If you ask any friends who had this disease, they will be like, uh, okay, honestly, the way I, my personal uh, favorite way of diagnosing a COVID-19 patient is, if they say the words, I lost my sense of smell or taste. Because cold fever is uh, alone, you cannot tell it's COVID-19. But the moment they say, okay, I had uh, loss of taste, my head directly goes to this as a diagnosis, okay? That is it for cranial nerve one. Let's talk about the cranial nerve two. Now, this is, you guys know that our nervous system is basically divided into central nervous system. And what's the other one? Our peripheral nervous system. Central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Okay. The peripheral nervous system is basically the nerves. There's the spinal nerves and there's the cranial nerves. Okay. And the central nervous system, can someone tell me the divisions? Brain and spinal cord. Yes. Anything else? No. Okay. Now. Can someone tell me a disease that affects the central nervous system? Structures of the central nervous system? I did it in my very first lecture. It's a demyelinating disease that Epilepsy. tends to... Huh? No. Uh, this is a disease which is demyelinating and it recurs. Like the patient will come uh, one uh, for the first time with one type of symptoms. The next time he or she comes... No, that's a degenerative. This is demyelinating. It begins with M. The second one begins with S. Oh, multiple sclerosis. Yes. Multiple sclerosis is a disease that affects the central nervous system. Okay. So uh, sclerosis means hardening, right? Not yeah. degeneration. Uh, it's... Okay, let me, I will come to that question, okay? After I'm done with this, I'll come to the question. Okay. Can someone tell me a peripheral nervous system disease? One that paralyzes from bottom up, from your leg upwards. Guys, I gave you guys these answers, okay? I gave you guys so many shortcuts. Embarry syndrome. Yes, Gillian Barr.
Okay. Remember this, guys. Gillian Barr syndrome. The patient usually presents with either diarrhea, with a history of diarrhea, or a respiratory tract infection. And around two weeks later, that patient will have paralysis from bottom up. That means it will start with the legs and basically it will go, go up. Next question, how dangerous is this disease? How dangerous is this disease? Yeah, yeah. Huh? Very severe because if his diaphragm and lungs paralyze, then he won't yeah. be able to move. Yeah, can uh, can you tell me the nerve that supplies the diaphragm? Phrenic nerve. Yes, it's the phrenic nerve. Okay, uh, it's it rarely affects the diaphragm. I know this sounds like a very scary disease, but this disease actually has a very good prognosis. That means after about a month the patient will have normal function again, okay? Remember this about Guillain-Barr syndrome. And this one more thing, it's about, can someone explain what this is? Can someone tell me what this is? So when you do a CSF testing of these patients to check for inflammation, so what you do is you take some CSF out, okay? And usually if there's any inflammation, there has to be a high cell count and high protein count, okay? But in this situation, that's not the case. The protein levels will be high, but the cell levels will be normal. Okay, this is diagnostic of Guillain-Barr syndrome, okay? The protein, that is albumin, okay? Albumin is a protein. Cytologic means pro uh, cells, okay? Now, I'm making a claim here that the uh, cranial nerve two is not a real cranial nerve. So which side should I put it? Should I put it on this side or this side? The optic nerve, it's not a real cranial nerve. So should I put it on that side or the other side? CNS, right? Yeah. That means diseases of central nervous system can affect the optic nerve, okay? Multiple sclerosis affects the eye. It's a very common manifestation. Okay, I'll send a case after the class. Uh, you can understand that, how a patient comes. So remember this, the optic nerve is considered an extension of the diencephalon. Okay, you know the diencephalon, the thalamus, all those structures, uh, literally the structures I drew here, this region, okay? This top region over here is called the diencephalon. There are more structures, but it is assumed to be a derivative of, it's a part of the dyan subplot, okay? Let's take a look at the pathway. I already drew it once. Let me draw it one more time. So we have the thalamus here. You guys can understand this, right? Uh, we have the lateral geniculate body here. Okay, lateral geniculate body. Okay, that will come, produce fibers like this, which will meet together here. Okay, uh, to come and meet like this, okay? And that 
can someone tell me what am i drawing right now what is this structure what is this structure Optic track. Oh, this is the optic chiasma. This is the optic nerve. Okay. Nerve, yeah. Optic nerve joins to form the optic chiasma. Then what is this? Optic tract. Yes. Okay, optic tract. And here's the lateral geniculate body. And finally, from the lateral geniculate body, there will be some structures which goes to the posterior lobe. This is called the, can someone tell me what this word is? Optic radiation. Yes. So I am checking the chat too, but yeah. Do you guys understand this? This is the structure of the optic nerve, okay? And is there anything else I should add? Yeah. Now, I made a claim here. This is one reason. The diseases of central nervous system affects the cranial nerve too. The other reason is peripheral nerves are myelinated by what cells? What produces the myelin in the peripheral nervous system? Guys, physiology. Schwann cells. Schwann cells. Then the central nervous system? Astrocytes. No. A long name begins with oligodendrocytes. Yes. Okay. Uh, and even this nerve is. Uh, innovated like the myelin is from the oligodendrocytes, not Schwann cells. Okay, those are the two reasons why they consider this to be a structure of the central nervous system, not of the uh, peripheral nervous system. Now, let's learn the examination. Okay, I know you guys have gone to the doctor and has been asked uh, to do this test, the Snellen's chart visual acuity test acuity okay now i'm going to teach you how to read one okay it's not hard first thing you need to make sure that you properly place that chart 20 feet away from the patient okay you hang it on a wall and you go and keep a chair exactly 20 feet away okay because what this 20 here the first 20 here indicates 20 feet Okay. The next thing is when the patient is at 20 feet, you ask the patient to close one eye. Okay. And you ask that patient to read from top to bottom. So you ask him this, you can, uh, he will say E. And if he can see that, that means read this. A normal eye can read this E if they were even 200 feet away. Okay. Do you guys understand this? At 20 feet, the patient would be able to see what most people would see at 200 feet. We are looking at the first one. Do you guys understand that? If he cannot see that, then his visual acuity is horrible. Then you go to the next line and at 20 feet, he can see what if normal people would see at a hundred feet away. Okay. Normal. Do you guys understand this? This is the part which you need to understand. If not, you can ask me. Okay. Guys, do you understand this? Okay. So, Let's go on. So now you go on. You ask the patient to read uh, and he comes to, let's say, 20 by 40. He comes to this part. 
and then he makes a mistake. He tells something wrong here. He tells something wrong here. A patient is allowed two mistakes. Remember that a patient is allowed two mistakes. Okay. If he makes more than two mistakes, that means that is his fault. That is his fault line. So when he comes to the next line, he cannot read it at all. Okay. When he comes to this line, he cannot read it at all. Just give me a second. I'm getting a call. Sorry, guys. So let me recap. So when he comes to this line, he cannot read it. He cannot see it that far. Okay, or he makes three mistakes, more than two mistakes. So then you mark this. So basically at 20 feet away, he cannot read what people who are 30 feet away can read. Okay. And what is this magical number 20 by 20? If you can read, if the patient's eyesight is 20 by 20, that means it's fully normal. Meaning normal people's eyes, if a normal pe person's eyes should be able to read this at 20 feet away. Okay. And if his eyesight is 20 by 20, if this patient's eyesight is 20 by 20, even he can read it at this distance. Okay. So this is what you call 20 by 20 vision. Okay. Now, what if you have 20 by 10 vision? So normal people need to be here. Normal people. Okay. They need to be here to read this line 20 by 10. But if he can read from 20 feet away, that means he has supervision. Okay. His vision is excellent. Do you guys understand this? Let me, if you did not understand, at least privately send me a message. I will explain this because this is important. I don't think uh, you guys will learn this without any practical classes or something like that. Because I know that we didn't. Okay. You guys, okay, I'm going to assume you guys understood. Now. So basically, you do it for both eyes. You ask the patient to close one eye and do it here. Okay. Okay, someone asked me to repeat this. I will do it. And this patient, okay, let me do it like this. So you guys can see the screen, right? Now, if I was asked to read this line, if I was 20 feet away, I will be reading this. And let's assume that I am able to read till the fifth line. Check this chart. Check this fifth line. I'm able to read till that. Okay. That means my vision is 20 by 40 in the right eye. Okay. If I was to close this eye, I literally can only, uh, I'm not kidding. I can read only this line. Okay. Because both my eyes are compensating. I can see normally. I don't need glasses. But if I was to close my uh, right eye and just look at it with the left eye, I cannot read this at all. Okay. So if I went to the doctor, the doctor, okay, I'm a few feet away. I, I have to be uh, 20 feet away from the screen to do this. So if I was doing it properly, the doctor would write it as right eye 20 by 40, left eye 20 by 70. Okay. That means, but that means is normal people can see, but I can't see. Normal people can see, but I cannot see at a distance. Okay, sorry. 
Okay. Uh, what you write here is the final point that you can see. Okay. The best point that you can see. Okay. So this person. Give me a second. This is going to be my vision. Okay. It's not going to be 20 by 70. It is going to be 20 by 100. Sorry, guys. So basically, what people can see 100 feet away is my limit too. Okay. Did you understand that or should I explain it again? Okay. Let me come back to this. I'll explain it near the end of the class. Uh, let whatever I said right now, let it sink in and I will come back and explain it again because I feel I'll do a better job then. Okay. Now, cranial nerve two. First, you inspect. Okay. This is normal stuff. When you inspect the eye, guys, what is this structure which is Colored, what is this colored structure? Like brown eyes, blue eyes, what is that called? Iris. Yes. What is this black structure in the middle of the eye called? Pupils. Yes, okay. So in some diseases, there can be an abnormality in the pupil. Okay, that is what you check in inspection. Visual acuity, you need to check for three things. First, you must do the distance vision check using the Snellens chart. That's why 20 feet away. And then you do a near vision test. How do you do a near vision test? Twenty-five centimeters away. Yes, uh, you ask them to read a paper or something. Yeah, twenty-five would be the perfect distance. Twenty-five centimeters. You just ask that patient to read a piece of paper. It's simple, okay. And next, we have people who are colorblind, okay. How many of you can see a number here? What is this number here? I can. 29. Are you 29. sure? 20. <laughs> yeah, 29. Any other answer? Okay, so it is 29. So that is normal vision. But there are people who are red, green, colorblind. That means they can't differentiate red from green when they're close together. That is important. They can see the same way we do, but when those colors come close together, they cannot differentiate it. Okay, I'll tell you where uh, this is, becomes a problem. Okay, it's very interesting. And uh, this is what they see when those stuff are together. Can someone tell me one job in which if you cannot differentiate two colors like this, it would be very dangerous? Classic no, uh, that there's a gap between the two lights. Maybe. Huh? It's a very interesting, a funny situation. Um, cricket, <laughs> a sport. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Let me tell it. Okay. Uh, it's in bomb disposals. Okay. You guys know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they can't cut the wire otherwise. Exactly. So. Uh, I'm serious. This is actually tested, especially if you are trying to work in an airplane, if you are trying to be an aeronautical engineer, because this happened to a friend of mine. They went for this exam. They went for this eye examination and they were failed because they cannot di distinguish this red and green color. Okay. That's when they knew. That's when they knew they cannot, they are colorblind. So understand that their vision is normal. But when you get those letters together, when they're close together, the two colors, they cannot distinguish the two. Okay. So what happens if you wire 
something wrong in an airplane. That's one thing. Okay. The second thing is in bomb disposal. You can understand what happens if you cut the wrong wire. Okay. Especially in movies. Okay. <laughs> then the fields. Okay. What do you mean by fields? As you know, you have a field of vision. Actually, what is the vision field in humans called? Field of view. No, no. Uh, we have a special type of vision. By, by, by. Yeah. Yes. What is that? I can't hear you. I hope you're telling this. Bin binocular vision. Okay. Because the visual field of one eye overlaps the visual field of the other eye. And that is what forms a 3D image. Okay. You need a 3D image to judge distances. Okay. Otherwise, your hand will go and you need to think twice. You have to work a bit harder to grab something. This is needed for, for us in natural selection. Those who had binocular vision were the ones who survived. But when it comes to animals, let's take a rabbit. Okay, let's take a rabbit. Just imagine, would they, would the ones that had binocular vision or monocular vision, but gives a larger range. So in rabbits, they have a huge field of vision. Okay. Would these rabbits survive or would the rabbits who had their eyes in the front survive? When I say rabbits, I'm talking about uh, monocular, right? Yes. The ones, the eyes in the sides. Yes. Because Understand they that. are the, they're the yes. prey. Exactly. Because they are the prey, the ones that had their eyes on the side, they were the ones that survived. That's why prey have their uh, eyes on the side and the predators usually have their eyes more with the binocular vision. Okay. And what we must do is we must test this in humans also. Okay. Remember in, I did a case in which a patient says she cannot see her lateral aspect. When she's driving, she cannot see a vehicle overtaking her. She cannot see vehicles coming from either side of her. Do you remember that case? If so, I can move ahead. Okay, let me just tell what happened there. A patient comes to the doctor saying she cannot see uh, vehicles overtaking her. Okay, that means this part of her vision is affected. Okay. Now, we need to check this visual field. And the way you do it is, Oh, sorry, I shouldn't delete it. You bring your finger. Let me uh, take this to a place where you guys can appreciate this better. Okay, I'll just keep it here for now. So basically, you as the examiner must bring your finger to the, from your experiences, you will know where to bring it. But basically, you need to bring it to a far edge. Okay. You bring your finger here and then you do this or you just move it around to do some sort of movement and you ask the patient to tell, okay, let me tell it like this. You can bring your finger like this. Okay. Guys, can you understand this diagram? I'm trying to draw a 3D diagram. So basically, you bring your finger and you ask the patient, can you see this here? If the patient, you cannot see it, right? I'm doing it out of the screen, same situation. And once you come to a place in, the, in his vision also that he can see, he's supposed to tell, okay, now I can see the finger. Okay. Then you come, do it for the other side. Okay. And you must have the experience to understand, okay. He can, he or she can see properly. 
Okay, because imagine the patient cannot see the finger. Okay, the patient cannot see. You guys cannot see my finger, even though it was literally just here. It wasn't far from my body. That is what you check in this visual field acuity test. You guys understand this? Okay. Then. So the next thing is you need to check the blind spot. Okay. You know, at a certain point, the place in which when you bring your eyes together, let me draw that. Mm. There's a certain point in your eye where you miss out things. Okay? There's a certain point in your eye where you will miss out things. Okay? You need to check the location of that. Is it in the middle? Is it somewhere in the middle? Or is it to the side? Okay? Uh, next, let me talk about the reflexes. You guys, if you have any questions, please ask. Next, ask a patient to focus on a dark or on a distant object. Now, what you need to do is, I hope you guys know from basic uh, sciences that When you look at a far object, your pupils are dilated like this, okay? When you bring that object closer, the pupil becomes, okay, when, sorry, sorry. When you look at a dark object, to bring more light, our pupils dilate like this. But when you look at a bright object, our pupils must constrict. You guys understand this? So what happens is, normally, when one pupil dilates, or constricts, the other one must do the same with, at the same level. Okay, if this is, let's say, three millimeters, this also has to be three millimeters. Okay? I hope you guys understand this. Now, let's take a look at this. Okay? You ask a patient to look at a distant object. Okay? So, you are telling the patient to look far. And then you suddenly bring your finger here. You should see the pupil constrict. And also you should see the eyes move inwards. You're asking him to look far. And then you suddenly bring your finger and tell him to look at that. You should see the eyes come inward. Okay? Guys, these are step-by-step -step things you need to do. Okay? And the next one, in a dimly lit room that is in a dark room so that means the pupil will be dilated in a dark room to get more light our pupils will be dilated okay you ask them to hold their hand like this you need to do this okay i don't know if you have learned this yet or not and then what you do is you shine a light you shine a light to one eye you look at that eye first and see if it constricts. When you shine a bright light, you need to check if this, this constricts like this. Okay? So it was like this. And the moment you shone the light, it constricted like this. The same must happen in the other eye. Okay, this is called the direct reflex. The reason you shine the light directly at that, okay? And this is, the other eye will also undergo the same thing. Here's your hand. The other eye must also constrict. And when you look at it, you call this the indirect reflex. You guys understand this? Now, let's say 
there's a problem in which this i does not you are you are shining the light there it only constricts to this amount but the other one constricts to this amount can someone tell me which is the normal light the first one or the second one which is the normal light uh the second one yes it has to be the second one okay that's that has to be the maximum it has to be normally constricted that has to be the amount it's the other one is supposed to constrict okay that means there is going to be a problem in the optic nerve okay if let's say there's a problem no matter what you do the patient's eyes both eyes are not contracting like the pupils are not contracting that means there is a optic nerve lesion in both the nerves okay see sorry uh wait 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 let me explain that let me explain this let's say if the first situation is because the muscle is weak okay what is the what is the nerve that innervates these ocular muscles and the extraocular muscles what is the nerve that innervates the muscles we didn't go to that yet what is the nerve that innervates the intraocular muscles okay uh, ocular motor nerve oh sorry yeah it's the ocular motor nerve okay so if one eye is working fine while the other eye is not working properly that means it's a problem in the muscle understand that one eye is working fine while the other is not working properly it means there's a problem with the muscle or the nerve okay but if both eyes don't care about this light reflex if both are the same way as it is then it is because of a optic nerve lesion okay if the optic nerve doesn't detect that there's a lot of light it is not going to tell the pupil to contract okay how would the pupil know to contract there has to be some signal from the optic nerve telling there's too much light uh, close your window okay and uh, swinging light test it's basically the same thing okay uh, you check to see if uh, the pupils dilate and constrict to the same size you take a light as the person to hold the hand and you swing the light like this okay and finally let's learn to read an ophthalmoscope okay this is important in diseases such as diabetes i'll do a small lecture it's not hard it's not a big thing uh, i'll do like a 15 20 minute video on this diabetes glaucoma you you were titis u e i t i t i s you were titis all of these you use the ophthalmoscope to check the eye and let me tell you guys what you can see here is something called the optic cup okay it is formed uh, i hope you guys remember when you guys studied the eyeball here is the aqueous humor and here is where the optic nerve originates okay so this is where the op okay this is where the optic nerve originates okay now what happens if you uh, if there is increased this is vitreous humor let me draw it properly this is the optic cup and this is the vitreous humor and over here beyond the point of the lens we have 
so guys there's the ciliary body all of these the uveal layer all of those i didn't draw those what is the fluid which is present in this region what is the name of the fluid present in this region aqueous humor yes aqueous humor which of these two fluids is permanently present like it does not change every day aqueous humor yes this is a permanently present structure in the sense it does not uh, side recycle okay uh and aqueous humor there is a drainage system so here are some ciliary processes there are some ciliary processes which produce this aqueous humor okay and that also if you have if you joined my lecture on um, cystic fibrosis and bronchiectasis you will understand what i'm going to tell problem first sodium is pumped out okay can someone tell me who comes behind the sodium water water before that chlorine chlorine yes. chlorine will follow and now because this area is very concentrated water will follow okay so that's what happens here uh, sodium is actively pumped out into this space and then chloride ions also follow bicarbonate too but then water will follow that's what produces this aqueous humor okay and it has to drain through a scleral structure it has to drain through can someone tell me the name of the point in which the sclera and the cornea join can someone tell me okay uh, this is called the limbus okay so right now i'm doing a bit of ophthalmology also uh let me take an image okay let me just go to a different note so this is my note for ophthalmology here are the capillary loops that produce the aqueous fluid that will come and they must drain here okay they must drain through these trabecular net uh, meshwork so what i'm basically talking about is the condition glaucoma okay it must drain through this trabecular meshwork uh and that drains into a lymphatic system called the canals of schlem okay and this angle at which you get these trabecular meshwork is called the irido corneal angle look at this it is formed by the iris let me use a different color it is formed by the ciliary body it is formed by the sclera and it is formed by the cornea so you call it the irido corneal angle okay that is the normal drainage pathway what happens if there is no drainage if there is a blockage here let's say there is some sort of a blockage in this tract there is a alternative tract but 90% drain from this tract so what will happen is it is going to push the lens it is going to the pressure will push back on the lens okay because there is going to be continuous production and this will cause the aqueous the vitreous which is more gelatinous like to push on the optic cup so if it was supposed to normally be like this it is now going to be like this okay it is going to now look like this uh let me go back to the why am i going into that much detail here it is because to diagnose glaucoma you check this ratio okay so you check the size of the optic cup and you can see the bright really bright structure over here is the optic cusp and this region is called the optic disc so you check the ratio okay 
you check the ratio and if it is normal you should get a tiny optic cup like this so the you can measure this you can measure this these diameters okay what happens in glaucoma is you get a large one angle like this do you guys understand this i gave you guys the brief introduction into glaucoma and how to diagnose it using an ophthalmoscope okay then we have our arteries so arteries are what is usually affected in uv uvi titis uvititis i cannot pronounce this so basically the uvia is the choroid the ciliary body and the iris okay this is the vascular layer so if there is any problem in this if this is the vascular layer the arteries are affected okay don't worry i will do a proper discussion on this later uveitis and uh, then we have uh, what is it diabetes mellitus that also causes changes here and finally let's take a look at this the fovea and the macula can someone tell me what is the, the function of fovea and macula what is that structure uh, it's for the central vision yes that word central vision okay it has the highest concentration of cones guys this is ophthalmology or i don't know anatomy it has the highest concentration of cones so it is used for central vision okay actually we learned it in physiology not the ophthalmoscopy part this is uh, not taught there chan yeah uh let's say if a patient has cataract mm -hmm. so the uh, for that he is having cataract surgery so that surgery will it remove like will it change the pupil size or helps to increase the contactability okay okay uh i will go in so let me go into detail about that uh, let me take my ophthalmology note let me tell you guys one cause of cataracts okay now our cornea has five layers there are five layers okay one cause what okay what you need to know is there are some water pumps there are some water pumps that pulls water out from the cornea okay the cornea is the outermost now if you take a look at the eye you can see the pupil here here sorry the iris there and the pupil here and this area is the sclera the white color is formed by the sclera and the conjunctiva okay and the middle part is going to be covered by the cornea this entire region is it's a cap that covers this okay and it is transparent it's called the window of the eye literally that do you guys understand this so this is where our cornea is present normally the water pumps are involved in pulling out water from these five layers it is going to pull water out okay and when that happens it's relatively dehydrated but if something happens and causes water to accumulate that will cause the cornea to be hazy okay it will have an appearance like this that's when you do a cataract that's one time in which you change the cornea did you get the answer so sure no but then yeah will it change the pupil size it will not because uh, cornea is the outer layer right 
Uh, right. You change that. Uh, do you guys understand this? All this? Next, I'm going to go, this part will be fast. I need like 30 to 45 minutes maximum. Now, let's do ocular motor nerve, okay? Ocular motor nerve supplies the intrinsic and the extrinsic muscles of the eye, okay? Except for two. Remember this, L, R, 6, S, O, 4, R, 3. Remember this mnemonic device? Why is this important? Because the lateral rectus is supplied by the sixth cranial nerve. What is this nerve? Yes. So right now I just give the, okay. No, it comes to the medial aspect. Uh, give me a second guys. It comes like this. Like this, just like this. So this is the superior oblique muscle, okay? Superior oblique. This is the superior rectus, the lateral, sorry, medial rectus, lateral rectus muscle, and inferior rectus. This is the inferior oblique muscle, okay? Let me just tell you guys the function of the superior oblique and the inferior oblique. This causes something called intortion. That is, it pulls the eye, eye inwards, okay? Depress and inward, medial movement. Rotation, okay? That's the function of the superior oblique. The inferior oblique does extortion. For our lecture right now, we don't need to talk about the uh, inferior oblique, but what I need you to understand is, if you take a look at these muscles, if you take a look at these muscles, this is the superior rectus, the medial or the lateral rectus, either way, what happens is, these muscles, they pull back the, when they contract, when they shorten, so this is called the annulus of Zinn. So what happens is when muscles contract, the muscle fibers shorten, right? You guys know that. So when the muscle fibers shorten, let's take the superior rectus. Can someone tell me what happens when the superior rectus contracts? Where, what direction will the eye move, up or down? Think and answer. Up. Up. It has to move up, okay? I hope you guys understand this. What happens if the lateral rectus contracts? Moves laterally. It moves it laterally. It moves the eye laterally. You guys understand that, right? So that is basically the movement of the muscles. Okay? So lateral rectus moves the... That's why you call this the abducens. A, B, D, U, C, E, N, S, no it abducts the eye, okay? Superior oblique is innervated by the fourth cranial nerve, which is the trochlear nerve. And the rest, rest, that is the ciliary muscles. Uh, there's three types of ciliary muscles. There's the longitudinal ciliary muscles, there's the radial ciliary muscles, there's the circular ciliary muscles. Guys, I'm going to ask now, should I, explain the intrinsic ciliary muscles also right now. If you feel it's relevant for anatomy, I will do that right now. If you guys need it, I will do that. 
So send me a message. If not, I will go on. I'll wait for five more seconds. Okay, uh, let's do the trainer now. Yeah, huh? Sorry? Yeah, you could repeat that, I guess. Okay. Now, we have our ciliary body. Okay, I'm just, this is our choroid area. What I'm drawing right now is the uvea, uveal layer. That is our vascular layer. It has three parts, the choroid, then we have the uh, ciliary body, and we have the iris, okay, three layers. And when you take a look at that, you will see that the ciliary body, I'm going to take this to another page because it's going to be kind of messy if not. Okay. So the ciliary body forms something like a triangular shaped structure. Okay. And over here we have the ciliary processors. And over here we have the iris coming out like this. Sorry, sorry, guys. Wait, uh, this. Yeah, like this. Okay. This is our ciliary body, this triangular shaped structure. Let me just highlight it. This triangular shaped structure. Uh, that's our ciliary body and attached is a thin membrane as a muscular membranous iris. And here, over here, we have our ligaments, suspensory ligaments. Like this, okay? Guys, the lecture might go a bit longer than I expected. So we have the sclera, the white part of the eye. It comes and has a structure like this. Okay, this is called the scleral spur. That is what provides attachment to the muscles. This is one muscle. This is the longitudinal muscle. Longitudinal. ciliary muscle. Then we have the circular muscle which goes to the iris. Circular ciliary muscles. And we have some radial muscle fibers like this. Okay, this is the structure of the muscles. And I'll show you what happens when the uh, ciliary muscles contract, what I need you to understand is, here's the origin point. So the muscles will contract, causing shortening. The muscle will shorten this way, okay? That is all I need you to understand before I explain the accommodation reflex. And let me just tell you the arterial system. So here, there's a ring. There are some capillary loops like this which produces the aqueous humor. This section is called the posterior chamber. And this is called the anterior chamber. Okay. So it is going to produce the aqueous humor and there are two blood vessels. One is called the anterior ciliary artery. It comes from the ophthalmic artery. Okay. And the other one is, there's the long, okay, that's artery. So it has to flow the other way. Long ciliary artery. Okay. This is the normal arterial structure here. And the aqueous humor, guys, if you are to draw the lens properly, you need to draw the lens almost like this, like it 
creates a tiny hole that allows the aqueous humor to drain. It's a tiny area, okay? And it goes here and it will drain from here. There's going to be the trabecular meshwork and it'll drain through that. Okay, this is the normal structure of the muscles. Uh, let me talk about the accommodation reflex. Do you guys need time to draw this? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I'll give you guys one minute. So remember guys, right now what I'm doing is structures which you need for eye anatomy and physiology. So let me continue. So what happens, here are the muscles. I'm going to draw four muscles, okay? What happens is when you look at a distant object, our lens has to be thin, okay? When you look at a distant object, the ciliary muscles are relaxed. So when you're looking at a far object, the ciliary muscles are all relaxed. It's going to be like this. And when that happens, you can understand, right? The muscle fibers, they're longer. These muscle fibers, they're longer. Okay? What I'm drawing uh, opposite is, if you are to look at a short distance, Okay. Now, I'll explain this. So when the ciliary body is relaxed, that means you're looking at a far away object. And when it is relaxed, that means the suspensory ligaments are being pulled. It's going to be pulled far apart and that will pull the lens. So as you can understand, the lens is going to be pulled like this, okay? And then the lens is thin. The lens is thin, okay? But when the objects come closer, the muscles start to contract. And when that contracts, the tension on the suspensory ligaments decrease because they are now closer together, okay? And that causes the lens to become a bulge out structure, okay? And I need you guys to understand this. This is the normal shape of the lens. So if you were to remove the uh, suspensory ligaments, our lens will be like this, okay? This is how the accommodation reflects and this is the muscles and everything of the eye. And uh, the these are the intrinsic eye muscles, okay? These are innovated by these. There's two more muscles. Okay, no, those are extrinsic muscles. The levator palpi palpebrae superioris and uh, orbicularis oculi. Guys, the reason I'm going, uh, I'm willing to go this deep into this is because one of my next lectures will be on uh, ophthalmology related to the nervous system. Okay. Uh, let me continue. Now, let's take a look at this. The cranial nerve three, its location. So if you are to take Uh, guys, this is the midbrain. 
what is this structure which is posterior here called what is this uh, it's part of the corpora, corpora quadrigemina what is that called <clears throat> I just told it's the superior colliculus. Okay, and here we have the cerebral aqueduct. What I do in the center, it's the cerebral aqueduct. So here we have a black structure. One is more darker than the other structure, and it is a part of the nigrostriatal pathway of dopamine formation. Can someone tell me the name? Nigrostriatal pathway. What is this called? Guys, we did this for basal ganglia. This is the one which has the past compacta and the past reticulata. Substantia nigra? Yes, it's the substantia nigra. Don't worry, uh, I'm not going to draw pathways here, so you can use all except this space. Just keep some space if you're using a digital note format. So this is the substantia nigra, and the heavy, uh, the more darker one is called the pass compactor because it's, those cells are more compact. And this is called pars reticulata. And this is the structure which is damaged in Parkinson's disease, okay? This is the one that produces dopamine. And uh, okay, there are four pathways. I can't remember all four, but there's the tuburo, tuburo infundibular pathway, nigrostriatal, mesocortical and one more. I can't remember that. I'll check and send that. There are four dopamine pathways. So this is called the nigrostriatal pathway. And that produces dopamine. Okay. And oh yeah, we have one more structure here. It is red in color. Can someone tell me the name? Yes, Rubra. Sorry? Red new face. Yes. What are the tracts? What are the nervous tracts that originate from red nucleus called? It has a very important name. Like the spinal tract? Rubrospinal tract. Rubrospinal. Yeah, yeah rubrospinal tract. And uh, it is this rubrospinal tract. It is involved in mentoring muscle tone and posture. Okay, guys, this is how I'm going to describe the uh, brainstem. I'm going to take out each section which is relevant for our discussion and explain that. If you guys want a complete discussion, that is with everything, just send me a message. For those people, I'll do a complete discussion and it's you guys saw the images and the beginning of the class. There's a lot. Okay. The cranial nerve three originates from here and exits at the interpeduncular fossa. Okay. Over here we have the interpeduncular fossa. This area is called the inter. Peduncular fossa and it exits there. Okay. Now let's talk about the nuclei of the ocular motor nerve and understand its clinical importance. Draw it like this one round, one circle, and inner another circle. Okay. Now, think of it like this. Uh, here are the nerve fibers that go. Okay, these are the nerve fibers that go. 
the inner one is the motor fibers okay these are the motor fibers okay and these are the parasympathetic fibers parasympathetic this is how i write parasympathetic parasympathetic autonomic nervous system okay these are the motor and the parasympathetic fibers try to understand that the motor fibers are present more inner compared to the parasympathetic fibers like they go together and the parasympathetic fibers are outside like this okay why is this important let's say okay i'm going to ask you guys the questions let's say this is a blood vessel okay let's say there is going to be ischemia there is going to be ischemia of, the, of this region that means there is impaired oxygen coming here okay can you guys tell me which fibers are most likely to be affected there parasympathetic or the motor fibers think and tell parasympathetic try again motor motor yeah because remember this has to diffuse there's going to be oxygen has to diffuse in like this okay now let's take a look at the second situation this is let's say this is the posterior uh, communicating posterior communicating artery you guys know the circle of pilus right so in the posterior okay uh, Wait, uh, don't draw that. I'll just show an image in a while. So there can be an aneurysm of this. Guys, remember this? Can someone tell me what is this artery? I made it a bit anterior harder. Anterior cerebral artery. Sorry. Anterior cerebral artery. This is the anterior one. What is this one? This is the middle <gasps> cerebral artery. Anterior posterior cerebral artery. This is a okay. I, I drew it facing uh, this way. Uh, I don't want to confuse you guys, so I will not do that. But basically, let's say there is going to be an a bulging out of the blood vessels. It is going to compress which fibers, the parasympathetic or the motor fibers? Parasympathetic. Yes. And can you, you guys tell me a symptom of parasympathetic nervous system being inhibited in the eye? parasympathetic nervous system is involved in everything that is supposed to that is not fight and flight such as production of secretions so uh, tearing so tearing will be affected tears production of tears will be affected one function also the pupils will be constricted okay pupils will be constricted tearing so different disorders okay signs ptosis that is drooping eyelid that is uh, you don't need to remember this yet but there is a muscle called the orbicularis oculi second years okay those who are doing anatomy right now you better remember this okay orbicularis oculi is involved in closing the eye okay if there is any damage to that and the levator palpebrae is for opening the eye 
So if there's any damage to this nerve, there's going to be drooping eyelid. That means the eyelid is going to look like this. Okay. Here's our eyelid. Okay. Down and out gaze, I'll explain that. So including the accommodation reflex is going to be absent. Okay. I'll come to that. Done. Guys, once we finish the eye mass, eye nerves, the only big one is the vagus nerve. So let me quickly go through these. Okay. This is at the level of the inferior colliculi. Okay. We have the cranial nerve four nucleus. This is the anterior aspect. That is the front. And this is the posterior part. Okay. What happens is the cranial nerve four comes from behind and moves forward. Oh, sorry, sorry. It crosses like this. I told you guys the two systems which do not cross. Can someone tell me the two systems that does not cross? What are the two systems that does not cross? The fibers. Spina uh, thalamic. No, not the tracts. What part of our uh, nervous system does not cross? Is it the cerebral, cerebellum, or the autonomic nervous system? Which ones cross? Which one does not cross? Which ones does not cross? Cerebral cross. Cerebellum doesn't cross. Remember, cerebellar lesions, this is of the cerebellum, will manifest on the same side. So let's say the person's right cerebellum is affected. If the right cerebellum, if you guys know an anatomical drawing, it has to be, uh, this patient is facing you, okay? So this is affected. And if that means the patient is more likely to fall towards the right side, okay? Now, but can someone tell me the nucleus of this? What is this nucleus called? The name has it. Okay. It's just trochlear nucleus. Remember all those nucleus which are considered really hard. So I'll just tell you the nucleus. The uh, motor fibers come from the ocular motor nucleus. They originate from the ocular motor nucleus. And the parasympathetic fibers comes from an accessory Nucleus. Okay, that's it. Okay. Next, cranial nerve six. Now, can you tell me the nucleus of this nerve? Cranial nerve six nucleus. Um, this is nucleus. Yes. Okay. So just read this. These patients are unable to see ap objects approaching them laterally due to impaired gaze. Okay. So now what happens is these patients, let's say their right eye is affected. Their eye will be found medially. Okay. Because the normal tone, the tone that makes sure that the muscle is kept in the center. Just think of it. Here are the four muscles. This is not working. Okay. At all. So this is having its normal tone, the medial one. This is the medial one. So it is going to pull the eyelid eye this way. Okay. When it's supposed to be like this. Now I'm going to ask you a question. This is the right eye. This is the left eye. Can you tell me which nerve is affected? Abducens nerve, which one? Right side or the left side one? Left 
right side. Think again. Uh, remember, all these cross, okay? The only place which does not cross the nerve fibers, all these nerve fibers, they will cross somewhere, okay? Remember that except for cerebellum and the sympathetic nervous system that goes to the eye, uh, there are other parts also of this, but we discussed this, all the others cross, okay? All the other nerve fibers cross, that means Let's say there's a problem for those who are joining for the first time for a neural lecture. Let's say uh, so it is supposed to cross like this. Okay. So this is the right side, this is the left side. So the one that originates from the, the nerve that originates from the right side goes to the left side of the body. And in this case, it innovates the left eye, okay? So what has happened here? Which nerve has been affected? Guys, tell me. The left of you. Yes. It's this one which was affected here, okay, in this case. Now, cranial nerve five, it is the trigeminal nerve. Oh yeah. Uh, before that, let me explain this. No, it's going to take some time. Uh, I will send a short video after this class. Those who want, they can uh, watch that. So cranial nerve five, trigeminal nerve, okay? This is a nerve, I told you guys, which is involved in sensation and what is the function of the mandibular branch? Motor innovation. Of what muscles? The masseter and the temporalis. Okay. Why do I draw this man? It is because, let's say, okay. Now, let me draw the origin of this. So here's the midbrain. Here's the pons and here is in the middle, right in the middle of the pons, we have the principal pontine nucleus. Principal pontine nucleus, okay? This is for fine touch from face. There's two of them, obviously. Then we have the motor nucleus of the trigeminal nerve. So again, I'm gonna ask which, so these fibers, they will go with whom? Which branch? Uh, with whom will this branch go? There are three branches. There, yes. There's the B1. Uh, this is uh, thermic.
okay and with the this will go with this okay next we have two more nucleus which goes upwards <clears throat> it's called the mesencephalic nucleus okay this is proprioception from face and so i have to draw it on both sides one that goes this is also a nucleus this is called the spinal nucleus can someone tell me where it originates from the spinal nucleus can someone tell me where the spinal no nucleus originates is it hard it comes from the spinal cord okay that nucleus is a long one which comes all the way from the spinal cord okay so all of these will come together to form fibers and that will meet at this ciliary ganglion okay now can someone tell me the test to detect if the uh, trigeminal nerve is normal or not can someone tell me guys this is very important for neurology uh yeah you need this for neurology so can someone tell me how do you check if the nerve is normal or not you need to touch check it. yeah touch the patient's face yeah basically you need to touch now i told you our body our nervous system is very symmetrical okay this is the right side of the face this is the left side of the face first you take a cotton bud and you touch this patient's this area lightly you ask the patient to close his eyes otherwise you are giving him one more input we can't give that we need it to be only from the touching using a cotton bud we touch here we touch here and we ask the patient to tell if he feels it and if he feels it the same way okay if it if one feeling is stronger than the other feeling then you need to assess again you can't just say okay there might be something wrong then you do the maxillary region of the face and then the mandibular region okay now what i need you guys to understand is trigeminal nerve has four nuclei and only one is motor everything else is sensory you guys understand that okay now i'm going to ask one question to see if you guys understand the left right situation let's say the patient has impaired sensation here okay which side of which trigeminal nerve is affected is it the right trigeminal nerve or the left trigeminal nerve left left okay and which dominion which part of the trigeminal nerve is affected if these are normal if this is normal if this is normal which branch of the trigeminal nerve is affected? yes so okay this is how you localize diseases this is called a uh, neurological examination so what i'm doing is i'm combining anatomy neurology and uh, neurological examination so that's part of neurology okay next i will talk about the facial nerve now guys i will okay so i will finish the class in exactly uh 15 minutes so no 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 i will quickly finish this uh, it won't take long so let's take a look at the facial nerve okay the nucleus here is our pons here is our medulla remember cranial nerves 
six, seven, eight come here. Six, seven, and eight come from here. Okay. So cranial nerve seven is called the facial nerve. And it innervates now trigeminal nerve, it innervates everything that is sensory. Everything sensory except for this part. Except for the mandibular part, everything else is sensory. The cranial nerve is the opposite. It innervates everything motor. Okay. It innervates all the facial muscles, the ones you smile with, all your facial expressions. So if you have something called a poker face, this is actually something that people practice and develop. Okay. You know, when you play poker, some people have some sort of a tell. That means uh, whenever they get good cards, if you observe properly, you can see their happiness in the face. So people actually train their face to prevent that. Okay. That is basically you learn to control your facial nerve. Let's take a look at the nuclei. So at the level of the inferior pons, we have the facial nucleus. Okay. Then let me just talk about the nuclei first. There is a nucleus called the superior salivatory nucleus. Can someone tell me the function of the superior salivatory nucleus? Can someone tell me the function of the superior? Sorry? Saliva secretion. Yeah, exactly. It is going to uh, involve in secretion of saliva. Okay. And what does the fact, the word superior here mean? That there is an inferior one. Okay. It is connected. There's the inferior salivatory nucleus, which is connected to cranial nerve nine. Okay. Remember this. You must always write cranial nerves using Roman numerals. Okay, you cannot just write it with uh, numbers. And there's one nucleus which is present here, which is called the tractus solitarius. This is involved in taste, okay? Superior salivatory nucleus. This is for salivation. Okay, one, two. So there's three nuclei. What's the other nucleus? Yeah, these three nuclei. Can someone tell me the function of the facial nucleus? Can someone tell me the function of the facial nucleus? These innovate facial muscles. Huh? Sorry. Sense. Wait. Sensory. Actually, there is a small sensory function, but remember it as motor. Okay. It innovates the motor system. Okay, sorry, there's no sensory function. I uh, got confused. Uh, the taste is the sensory function of the cranial nerve seven that has its own nucleus. Okay. So these connect to the nerve. Uh, in the sense, they give the fibers, three types of fibers. And they will go and do these things, okay? Facial muscles, that is motor. Then, okay. Is salivation a sympathetic activity or a parasympathetic activity? Sympathetic. 
sympathetic uh, when you are yeah yes this is a parasympathetic activity okay parasympathetic autonomic nervous system this is how i usually write that okay there are different ways to write that as an abbreviation this is how i write sensory fibers go to the tongue and also to the ear sensation of ear and also proprioception from facial muscles okay angana what i said earlier was correct there is a sensory function also but uh, remember it more as motor because this part is done by this nucleus facial nerve nucleus you guys understand this if a patient have you guys seen bell's palsy have you heard of the disease called bell's palsy where a patient comes with drooping eyelids okay the eyelids is are drooping usually it is unilateral okay this is how they come then uh, these wrinkles this normal uh, you know uh, what happens when you contract your nose it puffs out it bulges out so the normal bulge is also lost okay so these patients the problem is it develops overnight like you are perfectly fine you are perfectly fine and the next morning morning when you wake up you are suddenly unable to close your eye properly okay you are unable to close your eye properly you are unable to open your open your eye properly so there is going to be lower eyelid drooping can someone tell me if you have learned ophthalmology can someone tell me what do you call inability to close your eyes cannot close eyes properly what is this condition called it's called lag ophthalmosis you can see it here lag ophthalmosis okay and uh, the way i remember that is uh, so it is my own system and in a way it is wrong but the word lag means delay so these patients i just uh, remember this word by that word lag in closing the eyelids in reality they cannot close their eye properly okay and this leads to a condition called dry eye especially while they are sleeping so they are eyes get dry when you are under the fan or under an ac it will easily lead to dry eye and there, there are diseases there okay and these patients have drooling okay because remember all glands of the head the salivary gland the parotid gland they are also innervated by the facial nerve okay so this is working fine it will cause drooling because of the angle of the mouth actually that is the reason but i just wanted to tell you that all glands all motor functions are by the facial nerve next the cranial nerves originating from the medulla yeah oh yeah let me tell you something about uh, this bell's palsy it usually becomes normal on its own you don't need to do any treatment usually it comes back to normal on its own okay it comes idiopathically that means without any reason basically idiopathic is a fancy word for we don't know yet okay we don't know the cause yet so it suddenly comes and it goes it will take around 6 months and it will disappear okay cranial nerves originating from the medulla now these will be a bit faster we have 
our balance organs. Okay. And then we have our semicircular cannon. Sorry, we have our cochlea, which are for sound detection. So from our balance organs, we have fibers coming that comes to a structure called here, yeah, it's the vestibular ganglion. So equilibrium. Basically, what keeps you in balance comes here. Okay. Uh, guys, I forgot to mention this. For trigeminal nerve, you also need to check. You ask the patient to clench their jaw. Okay. You ask the patient to clench their jaw. And then you feel the muscles. You feel the strength. You can try it yourselves. Okay, clench your jaws and try to feel the muscle. You can feel a strong muscle there. Okay, that is one way you check the motor dominion of the middle uh, mandibular nerve. Then we have sound coming to the this is called the spiral ganglion. And that goes to a large nucleus in the medulla. It's called the vestibular nucleus. Okay, this is a large nucleus. Look at how I drew this line. It is not from the top. I always, okay, I used to make that mistake. Okay. Superior, the superior portion, lateral portion, medial portion, and the inferior portion. Okay. So basically, these go to this structure. I'm not going to specify where. Okay. And from there, it is going to go to the brain. It is going to go to the cerebellum, all the structures which are involved in balance. The spiral ganglion has, okay, this is the vestibular. Nucleus. The spiral ganglion has its own nucleus, which is dorsally located. This is called the cochlear nucleus. So they go here. And remember, guys. Yeah. What are the two functions of vestibular cochlear nerve? Hearing and balance. Yes. Okay. So I will finish this and end the class for today because one thing, vagus nerve is huge. It's going to take at least 15, 20 minutes. And uh, then glossopharyngeal nerve, if I'm to do it properly, I need to talk about the tongue. Okay. And guys, I will not be uploading this video on YouTube, but I will upload the next part of it, the one that I will not do today. Okay. So uh, let me talk about how you check for hearing and equilibrium. First, <laughs> you have the crude hearing test. Okay. You ask the patient to close one ear. Oh, and I made a mistake. This is the ear. Cut that part, okay? Once you close an ear, it's useless trying to test that one. So you close, the, ask the patient to close the ear and you stand behind him like this, you stand here and whisper a number, okay? You whisper something dirty or some, a number, okay? And you ask the patient to repeat what's heard, okay? You can play around with that. So you ask the patient to repeat what they can hear. Okay, and then you repeat it on the other side. That is a very crude test. That means it is not very specific because you can tell a number and the patient says something else. He heard the number, but he says something else. Or you say something dirty and the patient says that and you complain to the examiner. 
he's uh, being rude on purpose. So that is a very crude test, not really effective, but it is used. Next, we have the Weber's test, okay? That is a test where you take a tuning fork and you place it between the eyes. You take the tuning fork. Can someone tell me which end do you place? So I'll draw the tuning fork. Which end of the tuning fork? Is it the one or two end that you keep on the forehead? Hmm? Two. Yes. So this is vibrating, okay? You never keep that. You keep this end on the patient's forehead. Okay? And then ask if them, you have to keep it in the middle. Then you ask them, do you hear it louder on one side or the other? Like, do you hear it same on both sides or not? Okay? That's all you ask. If the patient says it's the same on both sides, fine. But if the patient says, I hear it louder on one side, let's say the patient says, I hear it louder on the right side. Which side of the nerve is affected? Which nerve? Is it the left cochlear nerve or is it the right cochlear nerve? Left it's the I'm left cochlear right. nerve. Guys, understand that it's always contralateral, like the fibers cross somewhere. Okay. Then you do the rinse test. These are very important names. Okay. The rinse test, same thing. This time you keep the uh, tuning fork on the mastoid process. You can feel this bony process here. You strike this and you keep it here. Okay. And you ask the patient to tell when he can stop hearing it. Okay. You ask the patient to tell when he will stop hearing it. And then you take it and bring it close to his ears and ask, can you still hear it? If the patient says he cannot, then there is a conduction deficit in that ear. That means there's a problem in hearing. In this transmission, there's a problem. Okay. Remember, sound travels better through air than solids. Okay. That's why it will stop. Initially, he will stop hearing it here. But when you bring it here, he should hear it still. Do it for both sides. Okay. And vertigo tests, we have done this. Basically, you ask the patient to close, uh, to go in a dark room. And uh, okay, in this case, close the eyes and walk on the same spot. Okay. You guys can try it. Basically, you will be walking on the same spot. But these people, they might end up somewhere else. They won't even know it. They're walking. Okay. That is it for today. I went into ophthalmology also. So guys, this one important thing. I will send the video later on. Like uh, in a day or two, I will send the video for these parts. Okay. If you guys need me to do an in-depth, that is, let me go into my, wait, let me open my other note. Guys, there's more to discuss in the cranial nerves. I just don't have the time. Like I have to, I have an exam coming up, so I need to prepare for that. If you want, guys want me to discuss all of this, look at this. This is the structure of the inferior colliculus. Okay. I didn't talk about any of this. Okay. This is if any one of you wants to be a neurologist or wants to do neurology one day, you guys can text me and I'm, I will do some lectures on this. Okay. For me, it's a revision. So all of these structures, look at this. So if anyone wants, I will do a lecture. And now there was a question, multiple sclerosis. 
uh, oh yeah, I have to do the guys. The lecture is over, but if you guys want, if you didn't understand the uh, that test, what is it? Snell's chart. I'll do that again. Okay. Let me just explain it again. Okay. So this ratio, this ratio which is here is a ratio of distance to chart over distance that normal people see. It's a weird ratio. So basically what happens is if the chart is held at 20 feet away, then okay. Forget this part. Forget this part entirely. We are not looking at that now. Okay. If a normal person whose eyes are normal is 200 feet away from this board, he should be able to see this P and tell what it is. Okay. If normal people stay 100 feet away, he should be, they should be able to tell that, okay, the letters over there, 100 feet away are F and P. Okay. So that is what you mean by this distance. Okay. Now, how do you check for vis visual acuity? You ask these patients to basically close their eyes and read E. You can read it properly. F, P, T, O, Z, L, P, E, D, P, C, C. Okay. P, C, C, F, D. Okay, he makes one mistake here. It's fine. He can go up to two mistakes. The next one, C, C, E, D. He makes mistakes more than two. Okay, you record this. You record this as his vision of that eye. Okay, you record that as his vision in that eye. Okay. Did you understand that? If not, yeah, I'm not going to go into more de uh, detail about this, but basically that's what you do. You check the patient to see if uh, the best vision in one eye. So if his vision is 2020, that means when normal people are 20 feet away, the normal people are 20 feet away, they should be able to read this entire line properly. Okay. If you are also able to read it, then your vision is marked as 2020. This is perfect vision. Okay. And uh, anywhere below that is considered like supervision. You have excellent, better than normal vision. You get it? One more thing, how do you write it? So now the standard way is 20 by 40 minus two, 20 by 40 minus two. This example, 20 by, okay, I talked about one mistake. So let's assume he made two mistakes, 20 by 40 minus two, two mistakes were made. Then the left eye, 20 by 30. He can see this line, but he cannot see this line. 20 by 30 and no mistakes were made. So you write it as right 20 by 40, left 20 by 30. Write it in the most doctor's handwriting you can and you have a good prescription. Okay. If, uh, if you want to be more, uh, if you are a student, you can add this part also. You guys understand this? So if two mistakes were made, I hope you guys understand. 
this whole lecture because i will most probably do this lecture last like i will make the video last but for this part i'll make it in a few days okay so if you guys have any questions send me a message and uh, if you guys want to join a lecture that has comprehensive brain stem uh, just let me know okay so see you guys then good night